All right. For the, for the rest of the immunology section of the course, so we've, we've talked about this arm of the immune system, the non, innate or nonspecific immune system, for these last first couple hours. For virtually the rest of the course, we're going to be dealing with this arm of the immune system, the adaptive immune system. Now, that doesn't mean to say that we won't have anything to say about, about the wow. nonspecific system. Obviously, we will, because, again, there are these interactions that occur between the two, two arms of the immune system. But we'll be concentrating primarily on the adaptive or the specific immune system. Uh, and in, for the rest of this week, and in, in my section basically deals with the humoral arm of the specific immune system. So we're going to be talking about antibody molecules and, and their characteristics, the structure, function relations, relations and, and those kind of things. So most of my time is going to be spent talking about the humoral arm. Again, I'll have, occasionally I'll have some things to say about the cell-mediated arm, but primarily we'll be dealing with this. Uh, next week when Dr. McCallop come in, comes in, who's sitting back there, uh, he'll start talking about the cell-mediated arm or the immune system. Okay. All right, so the topic for today is, is antigens. And what I want to do is, is I, I want to start off by just defining a couple terms. Uh, I, I know that some of you have had immunology, and you probably already know what these terms are, but I also know that in a class this size, there's, there's also many people that have never had any immunology before. So I want to just sort of define some terms so that, that we're sort of all on level ground. Uh, <laughs> and we'll start off by find, defining the term immunogen. An immunogen is any substance that induces a specific immune response. Anything that induces a specific immune response. Now, that may be a cell-mediated response. It may be a humoral response. It could be eat both. Right? But if it induces a specific immune response, it is referred to as an immunogen. And an example would be, obviously, anytime you administer a vaccine to any of your patients, what you're doing is you're, you're, you're immunizing with them with an immunogen to induce the specific immune response. Now, the next term is antigen. I want to define as antigen. And, and there, we use that shorthand designation for antigen. An antigen is anything that is capable of reacting with the products of the specific immune response. Now, all immunogens are also antigens. If so, if something can induce the immune response, it will react with the products of that immune response. But an antigen is only immunogenic under certain set of circumstances. And let me give you an example. I'm, I'm blood group type B. If I receive a transfusion with blood group type B uh, um, erythrocytes from some, other paper, from some other person. I don't react against those things. Uh, I don't recognize them as form. I don't react against it. But those red blood cells that I received in that transfusion will react with antibodies to, B, anti antibodies to the B blood group perfectly well. So those, blood group, those, uh, those erythrocytes are still antigens. They're just not immunogenic when injected into me. All right? So obviously there are things that are influenced whether or not something is going to be uh, immunogenic, and we'll talk about those in a second. Uh, now, having said that, that there, there really is a difference between what an immunogen and what an antigen is. I will also say that for all practical purposes, we use those terms as synonyms. And I will talk about it. And everybody, your book, talk, if you read your book, it, it's like this. And every one of us will say the antigen was injected to induce this immune response when really what we meant was the immunogen was, was injected to induce an immune response. But the terms are used synonymously, all right? And, and so you'll get used to it. You, you'll use it. Everybody will use it. The reason I make the distinction between the two, because there is a slight difference in the meaning of the two, is I think it helps to understand the next term I want to define, which is haptine. A haptine is a substance that is non-immunogenic. It can never induce an immune response by itself, all right? It is non-immunogenic. But it is capable of reacting with the products of the specific immune response. So it has the property of antigenicity, but it lacks the property of immunogenicity, all right? Haptines are typically small molecules, and when you, if you administer a haptine, to an organism, there is no response. There is no immune response to that. But once you have, if there were antibodies, the antibodies, for example, could react with the haptine. 
Now, obviously, there's got to be a way to induce those antibodies, and we'll talk about that in, in, in a second as well. Uh, but, but the haptine itself will never induce the immune response, but it will react with antibodies or cells if it's a cell-mediated response, okay? Uh, examples of haptines. Everybody's heard of, of poison ivy, the reaction to poison ivy. The resin in the poison ivy plant is actually a small molecule. It is a haptine that, is, that, that you're reacting to, okay? What happens is that, that that haptine binds to your own tissue antigens and alters your tissue antigens, and then you, that induces the response. But the response, after, it's, after you have the response, then you react. You, the response will react with the uh, haptine itself. All right, the next term I want to define is epitope or antigenic determinant. And these are synonyms. These words are used synonymously. When we, when we mount an immune response, say, against some protein that we've encountered, we don't mount the response against the whole molecule. There are discrete parts of pieces of that molecule that we, we, we respond to, and those are called the epitopes. So the epitopes or antigenic determinants are those, those discrete pieces of the antigen which induce the response and with which the products of the, the response react. So the antibodies produced after and the anti antibody response will react with the epitopes. The epitopes induce the antibodies, and the antibodies react then with the epitopes. All right, and you'll see either either of those terms used. <laughs> and finally, finally, antibody, and these are the, these are the products of the plasma cells that are induced by an immunogen and that react with an antigen. So these are this is what mediates the humoral arm of the specific immune response, the antibody molecules. All right, so what are those factors that will influence whether or not something is going to be immunogenic or not. And we'll first consider some of the contribution of the, the immunogen. The main thing that, that before an immune response will be elicited is that the substance must be foreign. That is what the immune system does. The immune system normally, under normal circumstances, distinguishes between self and non-self and only reacts against non-self. So that is the most important thing. Now, there are some disease states where you, know, where you can have autoimmunity, but under normal circumstances, it, it distinguishes for self from non-self and only reacts against non-self. So that's the most important thing. But it's not the only thing. Size is important. In general, larger molecules are better immunogens than smaller molecules. And in fact, I, I, I don't expect you to remember numbers, but usually things over 10,000 molecular weight in adult and are very good immunogens. When you get below 1,000, they're not going to be immunogenic. They may act as haptines. Molecules slow, below 1,000 can act as a haptine, but they, they're not going to be immunogenic. Things in between, uh, between 1,000 and, and 10,000, they may be weak immunogens, they may be fair, you know, so it's difficult to say, but, but if you go over 10,000, it's, it's a good chance that it's going to be a very good immunogen. So size is particularly important. Another thing that is important is the chemical composition. The more complex something is chemically, the more likely it is to be a good immunogen. So for example, polymers of different amino acids, like in a protein, are more immunogenic than polymers of the same amino acid, like polyallylase. Now, that doesn't mean to say that polyallylase can't be immunogenic. It's just that the more complex it is, the more the better of an immunogen it's going to be. And the reason for that that's true is because the epitopes, the antigenic determinants that induce the response and that uh, are actually dictated by the primary structure, or can be dictated by the primary structure. So obviously, the, when you have a sequence of different amino acids, you're likely to generate a sequence that's going to be foreign to the responding organism and can, can create an epitope. The epitopes also, however, can be not just the primary structure, but it also can be the second stru secondary structure. The epitope may actually be some alpha helical region or some beta pleated sheet conformation. Uh, and it can go on from there. You can even the tertiary and quaternary structure of the molecule you can create the epitope. So the more complex is something is chemically, the more likely you're going to have all these secondary structures or tertiary structures or even quaternary structures. So you, the, the more likely you're going to generate an epitope that is, in fact, can be recognized in foreign and to which the immune response can be directed. Now, those determinants, 
that are dictated by the primary structure, the sequence of, of the, the antigen or the protein or whatever you're dealing with. Those are referred to as sequence determinants. You'll see them also referred to as linear determinants, either sequence or linear determinants. Those that are determined by the secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structure are referred to as conformational determinants. Now, obviously, if you're dealing with an antibody, for example, that reacts with a conformational determinant, if you denature the protein in any way and destroy the conformation, you destroy the determinant. That's not true for the sequence determinants because the sequence is going to be there. The only thing, unless you chemically or, or covalently break the, the bonds, you're not, you're not going to destroy the sequence determinants. But these will be destroyed by denaturing the, the antigen. Another thing that influences whether or not something is going to be immunogenic is the physical form that it is in, in which it is administered. Usually, a particulate antigen gives a better immune response than a soluble antigen. And denatured is better, it gives a better response than the, the native form. And that's why in, in, in vaccine development, very often the vaccines that you're administered are going to be precipitated forms of, of the protein, for example, that, that you may be administering. They're, they're typically done because you get a little bit better response. So how the, the, the physical form can influence whether or not uh, you get a good response. Degradability is also important. The, the immunogen has got to be, at least in most cases, there, there are, I'm hedging on this a little bit because there are some exceptions to this, there will, exceptions that we'll talk about, but in most cases, the, the antigen has got to be degraded in order to be induce a good immune response. And the reason for that is that in some cases, antigens actually have to be processed. They have to be broken down into pieces. And those pieces, have to be presented by cells to the immune cells. And, and when Dr. McKellar comes in next week, he's going to tell you all about this process of antigen processing, what it involves, and what antigen presentation involves. But since the antigen has got to be degraded into these pieces, and the pieces then presented by cells that are referred to as APCs, or antigen-presenting cells, uh, it's important that the, the antigen be able to be degraded. Now, again, there are some exceptions. We'll see one shortly. Some antigens don't have to be degraded, but a lot of them do. All right, in addition to the, the contribution of the immunogen, the biological system, the, the, the responding organism also contributes some things, and, and the genetics is important. There can be species differences. There are some species that, that, that respond to, to a particular antigen, but others do not. Uh, example, pneumococcal polysaccharide is a polysaccharide capsule of the pneumococcus organism, an organism that causes a pneumonia. If you inject that into a rabbit, you don't get any response. You inject it into a mouse, you'll get a beautiful response. So there can be species differences. Some species respond to things, some, some do not. In addition, there can be individual variability within the species. So for, and we talk about them as responders and non-responders. You may, be, you may respond to a particular antigen. I may not if it's administered to me. There can be differences between members of the same species. So we, some people can be responders. Other, can, other people may be non-responders. And as we go through this, we'll see some of the reasons why you have responders and non-responders. Age is important. We as a species, when we are born, we are not born fully immunocompetent. And so the very young do not mount as a good immune response as, as older children or as adults. And similarly, on the other end of the spectrum, as we age, immunity wanes. And so response in the elderly is not as good as response in, in the in middle-aged population, young, or younger middle-aged population. So we, we, it, it varies. In, in the young, since we're not born immunocompetent, that's why we rely on maternal antibodies for our initial protection. Maternal antibodies get into the fetal circulation and provide us the initial protection. Whatever the mother was immune to, the child will be immune to shortly after birth. And then that, that lasts several months. And then finally, we, we start gaining our complete immunocompetence. Maternal antibodies disappear. And then we start making our own antibodies. So age plays an important role. How you give the immunogen is also very important. The method of administration, how much you give will influence 
the effect, the, the response that you get. <coughs> there is an optimal range of, of antigen or immunogen concentration which will give you an optimal response. If you go below that, you won't get a response. And sometimes if you don't go above that, you will not get, get a response. And that's why in your vaccinations, when you, when you give a vaccine to your patients, you're going to be told this is the dose that you give because that dose has been determined to be the optimal dose for getting the best response in most people. Giving twice as much is not going to give you a twice as good a response. So dose is important. How you give it, the, the route of administration, usually giving it subcutaneously or intramuscularly is better than giving it intravenously, which is better than intragastric administration. So typically most of our immunizations are done it's either sub-Q or inter, intramuscularly. Uh, <coughs> so you, you can get a difference in the response depending upon the route. Not only do you, may you get a difference in the response, but you can also get a different kind of response. Intragastric administration of, of antigen you, oftentimes leads to the production of IgA antibodies, whereas subcutaneous administration gives, leads to the production of IgG antibodies. So the nature of the immune response can actually vary a little bit depending upon the route that you give the administration. Whether or not you use an adjuvant also can influence the response. An adjuvant is anything, any substance which, when administered with the immunogen, gives you a better immune response. <laughs> and so giving you, using adjuvants can actually boost the response to you. So it's just a mixture of the immunogen and the adjuvant. You give it together and you get a better response than if you had just given the immunogen alone. Now, the use of adjuvants in, in human uh, medicine has not been particularly, uh, there, there, there's not a lot of adjuvants that are approved for use. And that's because the adjuvants all, all, always cause or cause a, a local reaction, a severe local reaction as well when you use the adjuvant. So it's not used a lot. But there is some that are, there are some that are used. One of them is commonly used in, in vaccines is alum. And mo most, of the, most of the vaccines that, that are prepared for human use are alum precipitated. Uh, and the, the alum is in, injected together with that, and it acts as an adjuvant. But other than that, there's not a lot. Now, that's changing a little bit because of some new new developments. I think in the future, there may be more, some more use of adjuvants in human medicine, but right now, there's, there's not a lot. <laughs> okay, so those are the kind of things that will influence whether or not something is going to be immunogenic. So what are, the, what are the immunogens that we're going to encounter? When we, when we encounter a pathogen, what are the immunogens that that pathogen has to which we will mount an immune response? Well, obviously, the first thing is proteins. And these are very good immunogens. And, and it makes sense. They're large molecules. They have a lot of different, they're very chemically complex. So you can have a lot of different structures, primary sequences. So you have a lot of chances of generating a lot of different ep, uh, epitopes. So the proteins are very good antigens. Polysaccharides are also very good antigens. Uh, and again, the, you, you know they're large molecules. You can have all sorts of different arrangements, uh, alpha-1-4 linkages, beta-1-4, beta-1-6, and so on. So there's lots of different linkages that you can have to generate many different kinds of epitopes. So they're also good immunogens. Now, nucleic acids in organisms are they, they can be immunogenic, and we, we, we can mount an immune response against it, but they're not particularly good immunogens. So when we get, a, when we get an infection, we don't typically make antibodies against the, back, the, the DNA, say, from a bacterium. Uh, but again, it, they are, we can mount an immune response. If I were to take a sample from everybody in this class, a serum sample, and, and look for antibodies to DNA, you would find, I, in virtually everybody, we all have them. But they, they're really there at a very low level. We don't make a lot of antibodies against, against the, the nucleic acids. Um, and, we, and we actually we make use of, of that fact in, in, in helping diagnose some, some disease states because there are some diseases where, that, where we do see antibodies to nucleic acids being produced. And one of them is systemic lupus erythematosus, SLE. One of the characteristics in that disease is the production of anti-nuclear and anti-DNA antibodies. And so since we know that in the normal population you don't see that, one of the things you can do in your patient is to look for anti-DNA antibodies. You see them there, that's, that's an indication that you may be dealing with a patient with lupus. So they're, well, they can be immunogenic, they're not particularly good immunogenic. Lipids 
by and large, are non-immunogenic. Now, there, there, there are some exceptions. There are some glycolipids and phospholipids that can be immunogenic for T cells and elicit cell-mediated immune responses. But uh, by and large, they're not. All right? So we don't make antibodies against li li the lipids in the membranes of a bacterium that, that say, we get infected with. Uh, so typically non-immunogenic, non with a few exceptions. All right. <laughs> so all the antigens are divided into two major categories, the T-independent and T-dependent, and the, the division is based on, on the requirement for T-cell help in, for, in order for a B-cell to make the antibodies. The T-independent antigens obviously don't require any help from T-cells. The B-cells can make the antibodies by themselves. And what I want to do is I want to talk a little bit about the, mainly about the structure of these, or these, these antigens. Uh, the re immune response to, to T and to T dependent and T independent antigen actually is different, but we'll talk about the response to these antigens actually on Monday in the, in the last lecture on the antibody response. So today I just want to define what these things are, talk a little bit about their structure. We'll talk about the response to these antigens later. T-independent antigens are the polysaccharides. Polysaccharides are T-independent antigens, okay? And they have a unique structure. These antigens are characterized by the presence of, of many copies of one or just a few different antigenic determinants. So in this little cartoon, the black is, is to indicate an, ep, an antigenic determiner, an epitope. And you see you have the same epitope repeated over and over and over again. But you don't have a lot of different kinds of epitopes. In this, in this example, there's only just one kind of epitope. Uh, but these T-independent antigens have a limited number of epitopes, but many copies of those, those epitopes, all right? And that's what characterizes them structurally. Now, some of these antigens are actually capable of polyclonal B-cell B activation. And what we mean by that is that, that typically, for, for for most antigens, when you, when you immunize with an antigen, just a small number of B cells are actually responding. These antigens, however, these polyclonal B cell and, uh, activators, will activate a large proportion of the B cells, all right? And so that's why they're called polyclonal B cell activators. Now, these antigens actually fall into two types, those that are polyclonal B cell activators and those that are not, all right? And so they're the TI1 antigens are, are B cell activators, polyclonal B cell activators, and the TI2 antigens are not, all right? These antigens are also characterized by they're relatively resistant to degradation. And this is the exception when I talked about degradability. These antigens don't have to be degraded, all right? And they, they, they can activate the B cells. All right, as I said, we'll talk about the responses, the immune response to these antigens later. The other, or right, here's just some examples. Uh, obviously, the pneumococcal polysaccharides, uh, lipopolysaccharide. So, so the polysaccharides are what you're going to see. Now, having said that, I don't want you to leave you the impression that proteins can never be T-independent. That's not true. The proteins can be independent antigens. And one example is, is flagella. The flagella are the, are the locomotion organ of, of bacteria. And flagella are actually made up by taking a protein called flagellin and polymerizing it. And so flagella is nothing else but a polymerized form of flagellin. Well, what's, what's happened then is whatever the epitopes flagellin might have, when you polymerize it, you just repeat that epitope over and over and over and over and over again. You get, multiple, you get many copies of whatever epitopes flagellin had. And so as a consequence, you generate a structure that has the properties of a T-independent antigen, and this becomes T-independent, all right? But by and large, the vast majority of the T-independent antigens are, are polysaccharides. So if you see polysaccharide, you should think that that's likely to be you then a T-independent antigen. But keep in mind, you, there can be proteins that act as T-independent antigens. All right, the other class of antigens are the T-dependent antigens. These require T-cell help. And the proteins are the T-dependent antigens. And as far as structurally, they're different from the T-independent antigens in that, the, in that these antigens have a lot of different kinds of epitopes. 
but a relatively few number of each kind. So you see here this, this circle. It's repeated a couple times here, but you, got, but you have a lot of different kinds of epitopes, but not too many copies of each one. And that's what characterizes these, these uh, antigens structurally. And, and these are examples of most of the proteins that, you, that, that we'll encounter when we get an infection. All the, all, any, any protein found on a microbe, some of our self or modified, uh, modified self proteins will fall into this category as well. So it's the proteins that are T-dependent antigens. And as we go on, I think you'll, you'll see why this is true, why this happens. All right. <laughs> when we talked and defined the term haptine, I said that the haptine was not immunogenic. It can't induce an immune response, but yet it was capable of reacting with those products of an immune response. It could act, react with an antibody, for example. So obviously there's got to be some way to induce antibodies that could react with the haptine. And that is done by using what is called a haptine carrier conjugate. And what a haptine carrier conjugate is, is nothing else but an immunogenic molecule the carrier, to which the haptine has been covalently attached. And it, it, it's not just mixing them together. If you just mix them together, you're not going to get it. You actually have to covalently attach the haptine to the carrier. And you produce what is referred to as a haptine carrier conjugate. If you immunize with the haptine carrier conjugate, you will get an immune response. These haptine carrier conjugates actually have two kinds of determinants, two classes of determinants. The native determinants are those that the carrier had anyway. The carrier, remember, has to be an immunogenic molecule. So whatever determinants the carrier had, those are referred to as native determinants. The other class of determinants that are, that are present are the haptinic determinants. And these are created by the attachment of the haptine to the, the carrier. Now, the determinant is actually more than the haptine part. The determinant is actually includes the haptine as well as some of the residues to which the haptine is attached. So, for example, if you're attaching this to a protein antigen, the determinant will include the haptine plus some of the amino acids in the vicinity of where that haptine is attached. If it's a polysaccharide antigen that you've attached it to, it'll be the haptine, the determinant will be the haptine as well as some of the sugars to which the, the, the haptine is attached. And it is that haptinic determinant that induces the immune response, and we then start producing antibodies against that. Once you have the antibodies, however, now you can take those antibodies, and those antibodies will react with the free haptine. You can just take the haptine alone and mix them with the antibodies, they will react, all right? But the haptine by itself will never induce the immune response. You always have to create a haptine carrier conjugate to get the response. All right. <coughs> what I want to do now is, is talk a little bit more about the antigenic determinants. And we want to really, we had, in order to do this, we need to discuss the antigenic determinants that B cells recognize and that antibodies recognize and those that T cells recognize because they're slightly different, right? In the case of the B cells and the antibodies that ultimately be, will ultimately be produced by those B cells, though the determinants that are recognized as far as composition is concerned, includes the protein. So B cells and antibodies will recognize protein determinants. They'll recognize polysaccharides. They'll recognize nucleic acids. And they'll recognize haptines. They can bind to all of these. All right? They can, they can recognize sequence or linear determinants. And they can recognize conformational determinants. So all of these things, will, will the B cells and the antibodies will recognize. As far as the size is concerned, and I don't expect you to, to, to mem, you know, remember numbers. I'm just, I put them up there just to sort of give you a feel for what the size of, this, of these things are. And in the case of the B cells and the antibodies, the, the epitope size is typically in the range of about four to eight uh, residues long. So four to eight amino acids, four to eight uh, sugar molecules. It, that, that's roughly the size. Now, if you think about it, if, if they're that small, and say the typical protein is maybe 100 amino acids, an average type protein, then a protein with 100 amino acids theoretically has a lot of 
epitopes. And we, one through eight could be an epitope, two through nine could be an epitope, three through ten, and so on. Uh, in addition, that's only considering sequence epitopes or linear epitopes. Then you have the possibility of conformational epitopes. So theoretically, there's a lot of there's a lot of epitopes in a protein roughly about a molecular or with about 100 amino acids. If you actually look at them, though, and it asks how many you find, you'll find that the, the number is much, much more limited than you would have anticipated. And in fact, in mostly, the immune response is to a limited number of, of epitopes, which are referred to as the immunodominant epitopes. And this just shows you a schematic of a, of a protein that was, was used, I think it was like 153 amino acids long. And what you find in black, that the bulk, the vast majority of the immune response, the antibody response, was, local, was directed to five epitopes. One here, one here, 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 and there. Now, that's not to say that there aren't some other epitopes of other places. There are. But the bulk of the immune response is directed against these immunodominant epitopes. And in the case of the antibodies in the B cells, these epitopes tend to be located on the outer surfaces of the immunogen. And if you think about it, it makes some sense why that should be. Uh, if an antibody molecule, if you have an antibody molecule, if the epitope is buried somewhere deep in some fold in, in the immunogen, uh, it's not going to be able to get at the, the epitope. So the immune response typically is directed at those epitopes that are available. And typically, in the case of the antibodies in the B cells, those tend to be on the external surfaces of the antigen. All right, what about T cells? T cells are a little bit different. As far as the composition is concerned, they only recognize protein antigens. They don't recognize polys. And that's why polysaccharides are T independent antigens, and T dependent antigens are the proteins. Protein, they only recognize uh, the proteins. Again, there are a couple exceptions, obviously, those glycolipids and, pro and phospholipids that I told you about earlier. But by and large, they recognize the protein antigens. Not only that, they only recognize sequence determinants. They don't recognize conformational determinants. And the reason that they don't recognize conformational determinants is that in order for the T cell to recognize the epitope and respond to the epitope, the antigen actually has to be processed. It has to be broken down into pieces. It has to be degraded. And not only does it have to be just broken down into pieces, the T cell receptor for antigen can't even see the pieces by themselves. Those pieces of the immunogen have to be presented to the T cell in, in the context of, of proteins encoded by this major histocompatibility complex. And, and Dr. McAuliffe will tell you about those, those structure of those antigens. But these antigens have to be processed and they have to be presented by molecules encoded for in this major histocompatibility complex. And that is only when the T cells can see it. And that's why, so T cells can't recognize conformational determinants because the conformation is destroyed when you degrade the thing into these small pieces. Now, in those instances where the T cells do recognize lipids, there is actually also an MHC-like molecule called CD1 that actually presents the lipid then to the T cells. So even in the case of those lipids, it has to be presented in the context of some molecule. Uh, the, the T cell doesn't recognize it directly, unlike B cells, which can recognize their antigens directly. As far as the size is concerned, again, you don't have to memorize numbers, but they're a little bit larger than the B cell epitopes. They're in the range of about five, 8 to 15 residues. And again, although you would predict that there should be a lot, there, there's a, a more limited number of, of things than you would certainly predict uh, from, the, from the size of an epitope only being 8 to 15. One of the reasons that it's limited is that since these things have to be presented by the, by, by the MHC molecules, unless you have, unless, the, unless that particular peptide binds to the MHC, there's no way it can be presented to the T cells. So the only thing that can be presented to T cells are peptides that can, in fact, bind to the MHC molecule. So that's one of the reasons we have responders and non-responders. If you have an MHC molecule that binds a particular peptide, then you will respond to that peptide if you're immunized with it. If I don't have, if my MHC won't bind that, that peptide, then I'm, a, I'm a non-responder. I can't respond to it. At least my T cells can't respond to it because I, they can never see the thing. 
because of this requirement that it be, must be presented in that way. So that's one of the reasons why we have responders and non-responders. All right, I want to just introduce the concept of super antigens. And again, this is, a, I, I can't go on to explain how these things work because you first have to have the lectures on the structure of the MHC molecule. So I'm just going to introduce the concept of what a super antigen is. And then after you have MHC, we can address it then again how we respond to these things. But what is a super antigen? When we, when, when we are immunized, uh, or we, we get an infection and we, we respond to something. The number of T cells that actually respond is really very, very small. It's, it's usually more than one. It's not monoclonal response, but it's a, a limited number of clones. So it's typically in the range of one out of 10 to the four, one out of 10 to the five of the T cells will actually respond to the immunogen, okay? That's a conventional antigen. In the case of superantigens, superantigens are antigens that are capable of activating a large population of the T cells. It may be as high as one in four, one in ten, one out of ten, one out of four of the T cells actually get activated by the, the superantigen. So a superantigen is one that is capable of polyclonally activating a lot of T cells, all right, a lot of the T cells, unlike most conventional antigens. So that's what a superantigen is. And they include things like staph staphylococcal enterotoxins. The, this is a toxin that causes a gastrointestinal disease. Toxic shock toxin. This is the toxin that mediates the toxic shock syndrome that I'm sure everybody's heard about. Exfoliating toxin. This is a toxin that causes the skin to actually peel off. It, uh, it's really gross. Uh, the pyrogenic toxins, a lot of high fevers and so on. A lot of these are, a lot of these are toxins. Uh, I've shown you things that have come from bacteria. I don't want to give you the impression that only bacteria have superantigens. That's not true. There are virus, viruses can have superantigens, uh, uh, fungi. There are, there are other kinds of superantigens, but oftentimes they're toxins uh, produced by bacteria. And the disease actually caused by the toxin is, is really in part due to this hyperstimulation of the, the, the T cell arm because the T cells, when they get activated, secrete all sorts of cytokines and the disease is actually mediated by this, hype, this hyperimmune response that we have. So as I said, that's what they are. How they do this, you'll have to wait until after you find out how conventional antigens are processed and presented and then how these things can, can, uh, are different. All right, and I want to finish by just talking briefly about some determinants recognized by the innate immune system. So we'll take a step back and go back to the innate immune system and, and, and try to compare what, what the innate immune system recognizes versus what we have in the adaptive immune system. In the adaptive immune system, we're recognizing very, very, very discrete determinants that are very specific to a pathogen. So when we get infected with an E. coli, we make a response against determinants that are specific for E. coli. They may react with a couple closely related bacteria, but they're certainly not going to react with a, with a uh, say, a strep or something like that, a more distantly related bacteria. They're very, very discrete, and they're very pathogen specific. In contrast, the determinants that are recognized by the innate immune system are broad molecular patterns that are common to many, many pathogens, all right? And so, so these, the, the receptors that recognize these determinants are going to recognize a lot of different pathogens. And the, the terms that have been used to describe these are the, the Pathogen Associated Molecular Pattern, or PAMPs. These are these broad patterns that a lot of different pathogens express. And the receptors that recognize those PAMPs are called pattern recognition receptors, or PRRs, okay? And we've actually talked about some of them already, but we just haven't given them the terms. Complement is one. Complement recognizes constituents of the bacterial cell wall. Well, all bacteria have walls, so it, it can recognize all these things. It's a broad pattern that it's recognizing, resulting in oxidation, complement activation, lysis, and so on, everything that we talked about. This mannose binding protein is a pattern recognition receptor, and because many bacteria express mannose on their surfaces, so we, rec we recognize that broad molecular pattern. 
resulting in opsonization, complement activation. The scavenger receptor that we talked about is a pattern recognition receptor. It recognizes polyanions. Well, a lot of things have polyanionic um, molecules on their surface, all right? This results in phagocytosis. And then there's a whole series of these toll-like receptors that we, we use the term toll-like receptor. There's actually a number of these. Toll-like receptor 2, it recognizes the lipoproteins of gram-positive bacteria and, gram and yeast cell wall components. So this will react. Any gram-positive will engage that receptor, and, and yeast will also engage that receptor, resulting in macrophage activation, secretion of a lot of inflammatory cytokines. Okay, so, we re so these receptors, these broad patterns are recognized by these pattern recognition receptors that there's something going on and, and, and sends a signal to activate the macrophages and, and start an inflammatory process. There's a whole series of these. TLR3, toll-like receptor 3, it recognizes double-stranded RNA. Now, why would we have double-stranded RNA? Well, it turns out, I mean, we don't have double-stranded RNA when we make our RNA. Our RNA is typically single-stranded. But viruses, when you get to the virology section of the course, you're going to see that many viruses have, as part of their replication cycle, a stage in which they are, have double-stranded RNA. And so we have a receptor that recognizes that. That is a signal to the cell that, hey, there's a viral infection going on. So what's the response? Well, we don't want to necessarily, we're not going to go activate the phagocytes. We don't want to do that. What we do then is this receptor turns on the production of interferon. And interferon is an antiviral compound. When you get to the virology section, uh, Dr. Hunt will tell you about how, why ant interferon is antiviral. But we, we, we tailor the response to the, the invading pathogen by these different re toll-like receptors. TLR4 recognizes lipopolysaccharide. That is the component on all gram-negative bacteria. So this receptor will be a signal, engaging that receptor is a signal that there's a gram-negative infection going on. What do we do? We activate the macrophages and give the inflammatory response. TLR5 recognizes flagellin. That's the, the protein of the flagella. So any bacteria that has flagella will, will, act, will engage this receptor and result in activation. TLR7 recognizes uracine, uh, uracil-rich single-stranded RNA. Well, we have single-stranded RNA, but it turns out that when you look in the when you look at viral RNAs, viral RNAs are very, very rich in U, in uracil, and they have, they're very rich in, in uracil in, this, in the single-stranded regions of the RNA. So we have a receptor that recognizes that. What do we do? We tailor the response, we make interferon from, as a consequence of that. TLR9 recognizes CPG-containing DNA. What this means is this is a cytosine next to a guanine in DNA. And you'll say, well, of course, we've got cytosine and we've got guanine in our DNA, uh, so why don't we react, why, why isn't our DNA activating this receptor? Well, it turns out that we've, we methylate a lot of our cytosine. And so our, our cytosine is methylated, but bacteria don't do that. So recognize, having a receptor that recognizes CPG-containing RNA is a signal that there's a bacterial infection going on. So what do we do? We activate the macrophages and, and start the inflammatory process going. So we have these, these broad receptors that give signals then as to whether or not there's a, what, what kind of infection? Is it a viral infection? Is it a bacterial infection? Not, and I, I guess I didn't point, to, point this, so let me see if I can go back. This kind of response, since RNAs are, uh, vir viruses in, are replicating ins inside the cell, where do you think that receptor is going to be? It's inside the cell. Whereas all these other receptors like TLR4, TLR5, those are external receptors because that's where we're going to counter bacteria. But the ones for viruses tend to be internal receptors. They're actually in the cytoplasm of the cell because that's where the virus, that's where they're going to detect their, uh, find their ligand. All right, any questions?